President Biden's overseas to try and get the economy back on the right path. The alarms are going off big time right now with the S&P barreling toward a bear market and the Dow on a losing streak we haven't seen in 99 years. Coming up, we explain why seeing the markets in the red can kind of mess with our heads. Plus, former President Trump's ex-attorney general, Bill Barr, he's talking with the January 6th committee about talking with the January 6th committee to tell them what he knew about the push to overturn the legitimate 2020 election. He's already said his old boss is responsible for the insurrection, so what else could he tell the committee? We're also gonna show you some tech that is super controversial here in the US, but on the front lines overseas, it's being used by Ukraine to identify dead Russian soldiers. We've got to look at that in the original. Plus, a new update just this afternoon on Brittany Griner, the WNBA superstar, with the State Department now able to confirm she's doing okay, given everything. What we know about her visit with U.S. diplomats in Russia and why they say it's still not enough. And Elon Musk denying an allegation of sexual misconduct by a former SpaceX flight attendant as Tesla stock gets cut in half. We're going to take a look at that later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie. And a very late rally is the only thing stopping the S&P 500 from ending the day in a bear market. That's the term that means it's down 20 percent off its peak. And the fact that it spent most of the day in bear territory at all is a milestone. Not a great one. You know, a marker for the markets here. And just to highlight how much of a roller coaster ride it's been, in the last hour of trading, both the S&P and the Dow, look at this, ended up just barely over the hump in positive territory. Still, this is the eighth straight week now that the Dow has lost its value. That hasn't happened since Babe Ruth was playing right field for the Yankees. Yeah, 1923, the same year that a Wisconsin senator launched a hearing into the cost of gas because it was more than 20 cents a gallon. Think about that as we're hitting a new national record high today, $4.59 a gallon. And the cost of the stuff you buy is the most it's been in nearly four decades. You see it here, right? Meat, poultry, eggs, all of it up 14% since last year. Used cars, rent also up double digits. I mean, it's hard out there for a wallet. Christina Partinevelos is here to break this down. So, Christina, there's kind of a broader psychological factor, too. When you look up and you see, like, all red, except for the last 25 minutes of the markets, you know, we know that the markets does not equal the economy. But talk through the impact this might have on investors and, like, regular Americans when they see everything down. Yeah, it's a very good point. I don't think we talk about it enough that, you know, what I'm talking about all day is not necessarily a full barometer of what's going on in the economy. Yeah, we had the markets that, you know, eked a positive gain uh, just towards the close. But I, we've been talking about the fears of a recession. We've been talking about inflation. We've been talking about the pinched consumer. So, of course, fear begets fear. We keep talking about it. There's been a sell-off over the last seven weeks, eight weeks, you pointed out, even for the Dow. And it is concerning. But when we look at it, on a larger scale. There have been comparisons to the, the, the tech bubble in the early 2000s. But in that period, from March 2000 to October 2002, the markets actually dropped 78%. So we're not at that level. I'm trying to be positive. There's just, we're, we're hitting a reality. Stocks have been really expensive, especially the tech stocks. They've yeah. been so expensive. Prices have been climbing. And so we're starting to see the valuations taper down. And of course, yeah, we can't deny it. Inflation is a concern. Prices are rising. And that's hitting everyone, not just you and I, but companies' bottom line as well. Let's talk about, you mentioned some of the factors that are at play here. Stagflation, which is this word that is out there. That is when economic growth is low and inflation is high. But there's a third thing that stagflation needs, which is high unemployment. And based on the most mm. recent jobs report, we don't have that. The job picture is actually strong. The unemployment rate is just 3.6%. So give us the gut check. Should we be worried about stagflation or not? Yeah, well, this is, uh, yeah, it's stagflation is here. There, there's no doubt about that. But the big question is, what is our central bank going to do? They can go two ways. They can decide to attack inflation by increasing interest rates. But if they do that, they could potentially put our economy into a recession. And when we're already facing low growth, that's a double whammy. Or does the Fed you know, lift off the brakes and maybe not increase rates as much and hope that the economy will start to pick back up to avoid uh, this recession. So it is a tough decision. Uh, some people, some economists and, and I guess 
commentators we have on our network here are calling for <laughs> the Fed to be a little bit more aggressive. You know, shock the system, get it over with instead of this slow pace of slowly increasing interest rates. But when you increase interest rates, that makes debt more expensive for everyone, for companies, mortgage right. rates go up. We've already seen it with the 30 year mortgage. Forget me ever buying a house in, well, I live in Manhattan, so that's out of the question anyways, near term. But, uh, you know, it weighs on all of our bottom yeah. lines. And just another really quick point, though, is the consumer is starting to feel, especially at the lower income range, uh, they are feeling the pinch. And we're starting yeah. to see that in Target's earnings and Walmart's earnings as well. A sign that maybe people are changing their buying habits? Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, Walmart's CEO in their earnings report, they said that people are now shifting to private label. And when you shift to private label, you're not buying the brand names. You're getting the local, right. the store stuff, because it's cheaper. Christina Parts and Evelos, thank you so much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. Good to see you, as always. Thanks. Listen, what's Thank going you. on with the economy is not just a U.S. thing. The whole issue is following President Biden overseas, where he's about to start his second day in South Korea. In just a matter of hours from now, he's going to meet with the South Korean president to talk, among other things, about fixing supply chains, creating jobs. Again, the domestic economic umbrella on an international trip. And this was really illustrated by his first stop off Air Force One a Samsung semiconductor factory. You know, we've been talking about how a shortage of chips made at factories like this affect what products you could and could not get here at home. Cars, computers, phones, etc. They're going to open a factory like this in Texas, promising 3,000 new American jobs. Right? That could be a good thing as far as the shortage and also boost some economic production at home. Mike Memoli joins me now live. And, and Mem, the, the president's about to start day two in South Korea here. And the messaging feels kind of clear. Strengthening ties with allies while also trying to do some work overseas to fix the economic picture we're seeing at home. Foreign policy is domestic policy in this case, Hallie, right? I've done a couple of these foreign trips during the Obama administration, the Trump administration. You've done them yourself. You know that there are often a schedule full of diplomatic meetings, but often they'll throw on an economic event, a meeting with a major business in a country to talk about investment in the U.S. This trip for President Biden is different. As you say, his first stop off the plane was at that Samsung factory talking about their investments in the U.S. He's going to end his trip here tomorrow, my tomorrow, Sunday, in South Korea at uh, Hyundai talking about their plans to build a new electric vehicle plant in Georgia. This is a president, this is a White House that has looked at the polls. Our new uh, NBC News poll showing that 75 percent of the country thinks we're on the wrong track. Only 33 percent of Americans approve of his handling of the economy. And he's trying to link that argument, making the point that, yes, some of the challenges we're fa facing at home, supply chains, inflation, are global challenges and they require global solutions. And he's got the policies to try to deal with them. We know that the supply chain jobs, et cetera, are not the only topics that President Biden will hit on with the South Korean president. North Korea, Mike, is on the agenda, too. And this feels a little bit like the other shoe waiting to drop, maybe as soon as this weekend. We know that mm -hmm. the door is kept open for talks. However, we also know that, you know, Kim Jong-un could launch missiles at any point while the president's there, which is not something we've seen from North Korea before, as far as missiles while a president is in the region, right? Yeah. And that's right. That's right. But it is a very serious possibility. Those are the words that Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, used when he was on Air Force One talking to reporters about this very possibility. And he said that that's what the intelligence shows. They're prepared for this kind of provocative act from North Korea. They have contingencies in place should it happen here. And his argument is if that happens, it would just really reinforce why the president is here in the first place. We need to strengthen our deterrence uh, capabilities with South Korea to, to try to deal with this challenge. But it's also interesting to see what's not on the schedule, Hallie. You covered a pretty major meeting at the DMZ between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. President Biden is not going to the DMZ, right. and you can sort of maybe see the contrast they're trying to establish there. Uh, President Biden, when he was on the campaign trail running against Trump, he mocked Trump for those quote-unquote love letters, as he put it, uh, that were exchanged between the two leaders. This is a president who, yeah, we're, they're expecting maybe some provocation from Kim Jong-un, but they're not really willing to give him too much of a spotlight by going to DMZ and highlighting that problem in a more significant way. Way. Real quick, Mike, I just want to give folks a sense of what we also might see this weekend, because the president will meet in Japan with other allies, Australia and India, too. And India is really interesting here because there is this push to get President Modi to take a stance against Russia, which India has not done to a muscular degree yet, right? So you've got, we talked about these buckets, the economic picture hanging over President Biden, what's happening with North Korea, and of course, the war in Ukraine that is still in the picture, too. 
Yeah, this is probably, I think, going to be one of the more interesting moments on the yeah. entire trip, trying to read the body language uh, before, after the fact, when the quad, as they call it, the leaders of Japan, Australia, the U.S., and India sit down together, because the U.S. has been very proud. President Biden has talked so much about the work he's done, especially with European allies, to take strong measures against Russia. India, this is an alliance, the quad, that's about China, but there really is disappointment that India, a fellow democracy, remember this is all about democracies versus autocracies, has not been willing to take a stronger stand against Russia because of what's happening in Ukraine. So that's really, I think, where some of the real intrigue is going to be as we end the trip. Hallie. Ma'am, thank you very much. Appreciate you uh, being up early for us there in South Korea. You got it. Speaking of Ukraine, let's go there now, where we might be seeing Russia's first clapback after Finland decided to join NATO. Starting tomorrow, now Finland's no longer going to have access to Russian natural gas. As for Russia, they're not saying technically that it's because Finland wants to join NATO. They say it's because Finland hasn't been paying for the natural gas in rubles, which is Russian currency. That's what they're saying. But you got to keep in mind the diplomatic backdrop here. Russia never wanted Finland or Sweden, for that matter, to be in NATO in the first place. It comes as on the ground in Ukraine. Russia is now saying they have total control of the steel plant in Mariupol we've been talking a lot about. And over in the east, military officials say fighting is really ramping up, so much so that today Russia moved toward getting rid of age limits for military service. So now people over the age of 40 can sign up. Cal Perry joins us now. And Cal, we've seen this move on gas before. How, you know, Russia may say, hey, it's not because you want to join NATO, but how, how you know, that, that seems like the ostensible reaction and maybe not the real one. Yeah, I mean, the timing of this seems yeah. pretty obvious, right? This is right after the announcement by Finland. The Finnish president was just standing next to President Biden 24 hours ago at the White House talking about joining NATO. Um, so it seems obvious. Now, look, for Finland's end of it, they say it's not going to affect their customers. They have figured out a way around this. It is definitely going to affect prices. And the kicker on this one, I think we'll have to wait and see, will be winter time, right? When winter comes to Europe, that's when the sort of Russian exports of natural gas really matter the most. Um, and it'll be up to countries like the U.S. now to backfill that supply. The U.S. has said that it will be able to. We'll wait and see. But as you've sort of said, look, this is a card that Russia had to play, right? This is their biggest economic card to play, and they're playing it now. What about the military age limits, the change here coming as Russia now says they control the hmm. steel plan? How much pressure is the Russian military under right now? Well, according to the Pentagon, they put 150,000 troops in here, and about a quarter of them now, about a quarter of the units, are combat ineffective, either stuck, not able to move, having withdrawn. Um, so we know that the Russian military has taken some serious hits, and we know that their original mission was to take the capital city where I am, and they failed to do so. Now, the way the Kremlin is spinning this, the age limits, is they're saying they need older folks over the age of 40 to work some of this specialized military equipment. That's their sort of cover story, if you like, the way that they're presenting it to the Russian people. But there's no question, this seems to be a point of vulnerability, getting people to fight this war. And keep in mind, the Russian army does not operate like the American army. A lot of these folks who are fighting on behalf of Russia are private contractors being paid privately to fight this war, Hallie. Cal Perry, live for us there in Kyiv. Cal, thank you very much. Not too long before we came on the air, we heard an update from the State Department, which said that WNBA superstar Brittany Griner who, as you know, is being detained in Russia. Now, she got to meet with a consular officer yesterday in their first formal meeting since March. They say she seems to be doing all right under what the spokesperson called exceedingly challenging circumstances. But he added visits with Griner are not enough. They want the Kremlin to uphold its commitment for consistent and timely access to her. In other words, they want more meetings. They want more access to Griner. Remember, she was detained at a Moscow airport in February. Russian officials say vape cartridges with oil made from cannabis were found in, a, in her luggage. The Biden administration says Griner is being wrongfully detained, and that's been a key categorization. I want to bring in Ken Delaney, who's joining me now with more. Ken, what else can you tell us about what we know about this formal visit now between State Department officials and Griner, the first one in weeks? Well, Holly, we know very little, and it was notable that the State Department spokesman did not describe at all the conditions of her detention or what that consular officer saw uh, when he or she visited Brittany Griner, because we're now learning some horrific details from another person who was held in Russia, Trevor Reed, who says he was in a psychiatric facility and was afraid to go to sleep because well, me, it was such such nightmarish conditions. Let um, me play so, that, actually, look, Ken. The fact that the United States... 
I'm sorry, not to interrupt okay. you. You reference it. We have that soundbite ready to go. And just so people know, this is Trevor Reed's first interview that he's done since he was released himself from a Russian prison in a prisoner swap. He was held overseas in Moscow, um, detained there in what, again, the U.S. government says was a, basically a wrongful detention. Here's what he told CNN about what Ken just laid out. Watch. There's people in there also that walk around that look like zombies. Were you afraid There's, for your life? I mean... I did not sleep there for a couple of days, so I was too too worried about you know who was in the cell with me to actually sleep. Um, you thought they might kill you? Yeah, I thought that was a possibility. Trevor Reed is now home, right? Brittany Griner is not. Paul Whelan, who's another American being detained in Russia, is also not home. The the U.S. still knows that it has work to do, and they are working to try to get these people out. Yeah, and according to my reporting, these cases are all being worked actively. Paul Whalen's family, uh, a brother, said publicly uh, just, I believe, today that he was told by a State Department official that the family needed to make more noise about that case mm. to kind of put pressure on Russia, which he was something he was not too happy to hear. But I think so, which suggests that the U.S. government is really viewing these essentially as hostage negotiations. The, you know, they, they, these people are wrongfully detained. That is polite language for a state-sponsored hostage taking. And the reason Russia does this is to try to extract uh, the release of Russians held in the United States who have been convicted of crimes. So, so the person traded for Trevor Reed was a convicted drug smuggler who had been sentenced to 20 years in prison, served 10, and President Biden commuted his sentence to do that prisoner swap. That's the kind of thing uh, that, that, that is being negotiated, we believe, in these other cases. But it, it presents a real dilemma for the Biden administration. They don't want to release people who have been convicted of violent crimes, for example. The Justice Department certainly doesn't want to do that. But they also want to get these Americans out safely, Hallie, uh, who may be being held under absolutely horrific conditions. Ken Delaney, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. By tomorrow, we should be getting the first real relief for parents on this whole baby formula crisis with the first flights of formula from overseas right now on their way to Indiana. The supply is on its way from Zurich, not far from Nestle's headquarters, and the planes will be carrying the equivalent of about one and a half million bottles of three different formulas. They're the ones you're about to see on the screen here, all of which are for kids who are allergic to cow's milk. They should end up on store shelves soon. We're not getting any specific timeline on that front. But we do know, boy, it could not happen soon enough, right, with the national out-of-stock average up to 45 percent. Ali Rafa is joining us here on Capitol Hill. Okay, so this is at least a tangible move, this, these Nestle flights of formula that are coming over to the U.S. The Senate has been working on trying to get more money for the FDA to help get inspectors, for example, to be looking at some of this to make sure this doesn't happen again. That's still up in the air, right? Yeah, that's right. That bill to expand access to formula passed unanimously uh, in the Senate yesterday. But that partner bill to essentially cut government red tape uh, to make it easier for these companies to produce this formula to then put on shelves, that is still stalled in the Senate. We don't even have a timeline for when it will be taken up. Uh, and as disappointing as this was to see, first of all, because of how extremely dire this situation has become, but secondly, Hallie, because the Senate actually had a, an extra day to work on this because the House passed it a day earlier than we expected. It also wasn't that dis uh, that surprising because we saw some uh, similar pushback in the House from Republicans. Almost 200 Republicans voted against this in the House, several of them talking about uh, their reasoning, saying that this is like throwing money against the wall, uh, giving it to the FDA without holding the FDA accountable. They're saying that this is really hiding uh, the Biden administration's missteps on this issue. Uh, and so while we see, you know, a general consensus over the need to uh, address this crisis and make things better, there's still this partisan mudslinging over what we can agree to, what lawmakers can agree to here on the Hill and when that can actually get passed. Um, we, we've got this happening. We know that more formula is on the way. At this point, um, what else could the White House, what else could Congress do? 
Well, lawmakers here actually have seized on this. They are using this as an opportunity, as we see so often in politics, uh, to really show that Congress can do more uh, in some cases than the Biden administration in tackling this crisis. Uh, some Democratic lawmakers even slamming the Biden administration, as well as the FDA, for a lack of action on this. Uh, today, we heard from the Senate Health Committee, who uh, they uh, announced a hearing next week with the FDA commissioner. That comes after you and I discussed yesterday his first appearance before lawmakers since this crisis began. And these lawmakers really held his feet to the fire and asked him, you know, what took so long to ring the alarm, to ask for help in this situation? What caused this crisis to get this bad this quickly? Uh, there's several other steps that Congress has taken. The House Oversight Committee has launched, launched its own investigation, sending letters to the heads of those top four uh, formula manufacturing companies that produce roughly 90 percent of the country's formula supply, demanding answers. Uh, several lawmakers are also calling on the Federal Trade Commission to look into this. We expect the FDA commissioner to appear twice next week for these hearings, along with the heads of those companies, Allie. Allie Rafa, live on Capitol Hill for us. Allie, thank you. We want to get to some breaking news that's happening right now, because we have just found out that a federal judge has basically pressed pause on the Biden administration's plans to lift something called Title 42. Title 42 was put in place back during the Trump administration. It limit, it's, a, it's a border issue. It limits asylum seekers from entering the United States. It was put in place, this, this happened, to try to stop the spread of COVID, right? This was a pandemic era move that the White House wanted lifted. It seems as though this is a decision that a lot of people had been highly anticipating. It seems as though the judge has said that is not gonna happen, at least not right now. Julia Ainsley, who covers immigration for us, is joining us now. Julia, bring us up to speed. Well, Hallie, this is some late breaking news and frankly, something that we've been expecting all week. Here it comes the very end of the day, Friday. We know that Trump appointed judge Robert Summerhays out of the Western District of Louisiana has now just granted a preliminary injunction. That means, as you said, hitting pause that would keep Title 42 in place. It was supposed to lift on Monday. We know that there are over 170,000 migrants waiting in terrible conditions where they're often exploited in northern Mexico camps who are waiting to come into the United States and claim asylum. Some have been there for months, even more than a year, because this policy has been in place. Now, there was going to be a political ramifications for the Biden administration should this injunction have not have gone through, because we would have seen an even higher surge than the record levels where we already are. That's something they were going to have to grapple with, and they still may have to grapple with it soon, because this injunction is just temporary. But right now, it's indefinite. Okay. The judge says that until there's a ruling on the merits of Title 42, and he, has, he gets more of a handle on this, he wants more reporting uh, from the government on what they plan to do, he's going to keep this in place for now. We should also mention there are other lawsuits challenging Title 42 being in place. That will play out. There's another lawsuit happening in Texas. This is all happening now in the courts because the Biden administration's move to lift Title 42 has been challenged so vigorously by Republican states who say that it will overwhelm them. Uh, even states like Alaska who say that lifting Title 42 on the border would overwhelm their states. I have a question to you on that, about that, but just so I'm clear and just so folks who are watching and listening are clear. Essentially, this means that there practically is not going to be a change to what we are seeing at the border right now because this will remain in place while the judge continues to gather info, et cetera. Yes? That's exactly right. And we should say Title 42 isn't a blanket hold on everybody. We've already seen right. a lot of people coming across the border, unaccompanied minors, some families, some nationalities, being able to come through and make those claims. But very often, asylum seekers are turned back under Title 42, and now they will continue to be turned backs because the judge is keeping it in place and not letting it lift on Monday. I was just looking at my email to see if we had any um, response yet from the White House on this, because you know that that'll be coming soon. I know the ACLU has come out. You've talked with them. I think, Julia, they're not happy with this. When you talk about the dynamics here, you have some reporting that you've actually broken exclusively here on NBC News today. Talk about timing ahead of this decision that said that there are some inside DHS who were concerned about if this is lifted, right? Let's say the judge had gone the other way on this. Um, they were worried about how expensive this could be, yes, and that they wouldn't be able to necessarily handle an expected influx. 
That's right. There are already internal concerns within DHS saying they didn't have enough money to cover this surge. So in some ways, this could be welcome news for them. But of course, the Biden administration had planned on lifting this. And just to put all this in perspective, Hallie, because it's not just about money, what they were forecasting was if they did not get as much as $2 billion in supplemental funding, they could have seen a real backup at the border. Migrants not able to get shelter, transportation, COVID yeah. vaccines, get where they needed to go to make their asylum cases in front of judges. That was all a real nightmare scenario that DHS was forecasting for the summer. It could still come. We are still at record levels in terms of migrants crossing the border. But right now, many of them are turned back into Mexico because of Title 42. So as of now, as of just 20 minutes ago, right, we learned not even. that's staying in place. Okay, Julia Ainsley, I know you have about 400,000 phone calls to make. I'll let you get to it. Thank you for being with us and bringing us that breaking news. <laughs> Appreciate you. it. Former Attorney General Bill Barr is talking with the January 6th committee, apparently, about talking with the January 6th committee. NBC News reporting that Barr is inclined to cooperate. The committee chair, Congressman Benny Thompson, had said in January to CBS that the select committee had already had informal conversations with Barr. But Barr necessarily didn't think he could be useful. Remember, he resigned as attorney general right before the insurrection at the Capitol. Barr's relationship with former President Trump, with his former boss, got really tense, let's say, after Barr contradicted him back in 2020 when he was AG, saying, no, there was no widespread fraud in the presidential election. Barr has also said he thinks the former president is morally responsible for the attack on the Capitol. Here's what he told Lester Holt back in March. I do think he was responsible in the broad sense of, of that word, and that it appears that part of the plan was to send this group up to the hill. I think the whole idea was to intimidate Congress, and I think that that was wrong. I want to bring in now NBC's Pete Williams for more on this. So, Pete, people might remember that Bill Barr literally called BS, that was his word, on former President Trump's claims of election fraud. He wrote a book about his time in the Trump administration. He's talked with Lester. He's talked with other people in other interviews. What else do we think the committee could get from him that he hasn't already said or that we don't already know? Well, I think there are a couple of ways to look at it. First of all, uh, because he's written this best-selling book, hours of interviews with Lester, with National Public Radio, with Fox News, with Savannah on the Today program, he could scarcely say, but I'm not going to talk to you, Congress. <laughs> so I think that was the first thing. The second thing, it's one thing to read it in a book or hear it in an interview. It's quite another thing to have it under oath in what we believe would be a closed testimony. I don't believe there's any chance that he's going to uh, be a, a, a witness in a public session. But the, my understanding is that he would agree to talk to the committee and committee staff members in a private session. But, of course, it would be under oath. So that gives them some additional security in knowing that what he's telling them is, to his best understanding, the truth. And the book, if you've read it, has a lot of intimate details about his conversations with the president and sort of the evolution of the president's concern about the election returns and his the president's growing frustration with the federal government's non-response to what he thought was a stolen election. As it relates to January 6th and questions about the insurrection, what happened after the election, for example, in 2020, there's some new reporting from the Washington Post out about Ginny Thomas, of course, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. The Post is reporting that it's seen emails from her asking Arizona lawmakers to help overturn the results of the 2020 election that was legitimate, right, to basically reverse the former president's election loss. I talked to the reporter who put that together on that other show of mine just a couple of hours ago, and I want to play for you what she said about what Thomas did just a couple days after the election. She sent uh, this sort of form email to two lawmakers in Arizona saying, you've got to stand strong. Don't, you know, fall prey to the pressure from the media. Uh, you have the awesome power, she said, to choose the slate of electors that will come from Arizona. This has raised some questions about a potential conflict of interest for Justice Thomas, her husband, in any cases related to the 2020 election. At some point, Pete, you cover the Supreme Court. Would the court weigh in here, or does that seem highly unlikely that they'd wade into this matter with a statement? The answer is no, it seems highly unlikely. Okay. And by the way, uh, that story in the Post says that some of those people that, to whom she sent emails got so many emails, they don't even remember reading her email. But, uh, you know, even if it was a, a justice uh, who was out making comments like this, I doubt the, the, the court the chief justice right. or somehow all the colleagues would get together and say, you've got to cool it. 
but uh, considerably less so when it's a justice spouse. So, you know, the fact is that the, the Supreme Court is, yes, it's, it's nine members, but it's nine independent members. They have to all vote together on cases, but they decide what speeches they're going to give. They decide what interviews they're going to give and books they're going to write. Um, there are debates in Congress, of course, about whether ethics rules should apply to them as they do to the district court judges, and maybe we'll see some action there in Congress. But there is no central um, hall monitor at right. the Supreme Court that tells justices how to conduct themselves. Pete Williams, good point. Thank you very much, Pete. Good to see you. Some you severe bet. weather all around the country. Right before we came on the air, we saw what looked like a tornado potentially touchdown in northern Michigan. I think we have a little bit of video. Some of the early images we're getting from there. Reports of multiple buildings that have been damaged. The National Weather Service is sending a crew over to check it out. You can see this here. This is the aftermath of it. Yikes. And as we talk about weather, if you live in the Midwest or the Northeast, I hope your air conditioner is ready to go. I hope your window units are in because you are in for some record heat that in some places hasn't been felt this early in the season for... I don't know, 15 years since at least 2006. You've got 36 million people under heat alerts across the Northeast, including in Philly and in Boston. It's going to be 97 here in D.C. tomorrow. The Southwest, meantime, is fighting some fires in Texas, Colorado, New Mexico. 10 million people under alerts on that front, with more than 5,000 firefighters on the ground trying to put this stuff out. Coming up here on the show, Elon Musk pushing back against the sexual misconduct claim, calling the allegation wild. We'll tell you what else he's saying next. Plus, Mercedes just sold the world's most expensive car. We're going to tell you the price tag. Get ready. Elon Musk tweeting up a storm, but this time it's got nothing to do with buying Twitter. It's because he's denying an allegation of sexual misconduct made by a SpaceX flight attendant back in 2016. In one kind of bizarre comment, he's calling the friend of the accuser who spoke with Business Insider a liar. You can see he's asking them to describe something on his body, like a scar or a tattoo that the public wouldn't know about. He says she can't. Business Insider is reporting SpaceX paid a quarter of a million dollars in a settlement after this alleged misconduct claim was made against Musk, the world's richest guy. We should note NBC News cannot independently verify this reporting. Business Insider says Musk called the story a politically motivated hit piece. Musk later denied on Twitter that he ever responded to their reporters. Jake Ward is here to break this one down. What else, Jake, are we learning from this BI report? Well, according to Business Insider, this was a 2016 incident involving a flight attendant on SpaceX's corporate jet fleet. And according to this reporting, which comes, as you mentioned, Hallie, through a friend of the stewardess involved, uh, this was uh, settled out of court in March of 2018 for about $250,000. Um, supposedly, that flight attendant uh, was uh, had signed a non-disclosure agreement, which is why uh, I, I, it seems that, that a Business Insider is not hearing from her directly, Got instead it. hearing from yep. this friend who was not held by that agreement. But yeah, a new uh, you know, and very public uh, uh, incident in a, a week of uh, you know, just unbelievably endless Elon Musk news. Elon Musk even came up with a phrase to describe it, and he uh, called it elongate, E-L-O-N-G-A-T-E, -E, uh, which made, you know, that, and now that term, that hashtag is, right. is trending on Twitter, if you can believe it so a crazy day here Allie. it's a lot it is a lot and, and just to add to that let me read another one of musk's tweets where he says the attacks against me i'm quoting him here he says they should be viewed through a political lens he says this is their standard despicable playbook but nothing will deter me from fighting for a good future and your right to free speech that free speech reference something musk does often but Jake, if you if you want to talk about standard playbooks in a way that musk's it's starting to be is dismissal of criticism of him as a political attack yeah, you know, and it, it's both, uh, you know, a sort of a, it can be construed as sort of hand waving, a smoke screen, just a distraction. But it's also shrewd in a way. We know that conservative uh, political winds are blowing against Twitter and against social media in general. You know, he's probably assuming, as are so many political observers, that the midterms are going to swing uh, the House and Senate to Republicans, and perhaps 2024 will give them the White House. Maybe he's setting himself up to sort of be embraced there. He declared himself Republican on. Twitter recently. Uh, maybe this is all just part of a, a thing to sort of get on the right side of history before power changes in Washington, Hallie. Separate from this, there's also, I think, worth reminding folks this point that the Twitter sale, 
he wants to buy Twitter. That is kind of up in the air here. His main company, Tesla, their stock has lost almost half its value since the year started, too. That's right, and it's a huge deal for the for both uh, Twitter and, and you know that deal moving forward, and for Tesla itself. You have to remember, right? He's borrowing Tesla shares or against Tesla shares in order to fund Twitter. Twitter only really pulls down about six hundred and thirty million dollars a quarter. That's what they pulled down the first quarter of this year, and he's going to owe you know about a billion a year in personal liability back to uh, his creditors if he goes forward with this thing. You know, uh, also. Think about it this way. Those Tesla shares, as they fall, are going to create more and more pressure on Elon Musk to pay this money back. You know, at one point, observers were pointing out, you know, back when he bought, when he bought or first made his move on Twitter, he was up around $1,000 a share for Tesla stocks. He's now down around $660 today. If it drops much below this, down to, let's say, $400, then his creditors are going to come, you know, barking. Banging and they're going to say, the we want our money back. Right. So, yeah, he is really caught between a rock and a hard place here, and maybe that's part of why all of this public uh, hand waving, you know, is, is there perhaps to distract us from that. Jake Ward, thank you very much for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Taliban rulers in Afghanistan have ordered all female TV anchors to cover their faces on air. The order came from the Taliban's ministry, calling the rule final and non-negotiable. One popular broadcaster there posted a video of herself covered with the caption, a woman being erased. Number two, health officials have reported now a possible case of monkeypox in New York. We don't know a lot about the patient, just that they're being tested at a hospital. This came right after we learned about that case in Massachusetts. There's also some cases spreading across Europe, too. Number three, an MLB reporter is recovering after she was hit in the head by a ball going 95 miles an hour. Kelsey Winger got hit during a Rockies game this week. She posted a picture of herself on social media showing her stitches. But luckily, she said after lots of treatments, lots of tests, she's doing okay. Number four, cave explorers have found a secret ancient forest in the bottom of a huge sinkhole in China. Look at that, it's more than 600 feet deep. It's home to trees that stretch more than 100 feet high. Researchers say this is a huge deal because they could end up finding new species of plants and animals. Number five, Mercedes-Benz has sold the world's most expensive car. Check it out, a super rare SLR coupe from 1955. Sold to a private owner, guess how much? Take one second, think in your head of a number. Is the number 142 million? Oof, because that's what it's sold for. Now, Mercedes does say the money from the sale is going to be used to create a big scholarship fund. Still ahead. Things aren't looking too great for David Perdue, former senator who's running for governor in Georgia. He's down in the polls, and former President Trump seems to be over his candidacy after pushing him to run. We're going to explain that coming up live in Atlanta. Buckingham Palace pulling out all the stops for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. You're going to see big stars, but what about the Queen? Is she herself going to be able to make it? We're going to talk about that later in the show. Down in Georgia, you have former Senator David Perdue out in Savannah, Georgia today, saying, hey, get out there and vote in Tuesday's primary. The Republican candidate for governor saying former President Trump is still very much invested in his campaign. Listen. If we want a conservative Republican in the White House in 24, and we want to get our Senate majority back in 22, we have to win this governor's race. This is bigger than me. And I think Donald Trump knows that, and that's why he supported me from the very beginning. But here's the thing. Sources are telling NBC News that the former president is kind of washing his hands of Purdue. He's apparently been grousing about a lackluster effort. He's not going to make any more appearances ahead of Tuesday's vote. Polls showing incumbent Governor Brian Kemp way ahead right now, something like 30 points in one poll. Republicans say former President Trump really doesn't care if Purdue wins as long as Kemp loses, since Kemp didn't help him spread the big lie to try to overturn the 2020 election. And these primaries, remember, the legitimate election, these primaries seem to have people really fired up. Look at these numbers from the Georgia Secretary of State's office. Voting is up 180 percent from 2018. John Allen joins me now. John, those numbers, early voting, people are, it seems like the takeaways, people are very into this race. There is some enthusiasm here in Georgia as we're seeing in these early voting numbers. People wanted to vote. Absolutely. Um, and look, they've been getting uh, bombarded with messaging about this election uh, for quite a while. You've uh, 
You've certainly got a bunch of down ballot races as well that have been interesting because President, uh, former President Donald Trump is in, uh, in, endorsed in those races. He looks at Georgia as ground zero for him. It's where he believes uh, he was robbed in uh, 2020. Of course, that is false, and it's where he tried to get votes overturned, which is why he's so angry at Governor uh, Brian Kemp and Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, and he's trying to get them unseated. So Kemp and Raffensperger, let me take those two buckets. Both of these are Georgia state officials who in 2020 resisted the former president's push to try to get them to go against the legitimate results of the election, right? Brad Raffensperger, the secretary of state, was on the other end of that now infamous phone call where Donald Trump said, please, you know, find the votes, if you will. That's why this state is so interesting, John, right? Because it is this sort of litmus test of the Trump endorsement. It doesn't seem to be going well for his endorsement of Purdue, but like Herschel Walker, maybe a different story. And it's not just the test of like sort of how Trump is doing with these candidates, how he's doing with his endorsements. Of course, Herschel Walker, who not only has the endorsement of Trump, but also the support of a lot of establishment figures like uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is a little bit of a different story. But it's not just we get a gauge of how Trump's endorsement is working. The stakes are so big for him, particularly if he runs again in 2024. He wants people who are loyal to him, faithful to him, mm. in positions to uh, potentially safeguard or even overturn election results in the future. He was uh, stonewalled in that effort by Brad Raffensperger, the state, Secretary of State, and Governor Kemp, who uh, looks to be cruising to re-election as if he's in one of those uh, SLR cars you just showed on the show a little bit earlier. Um, <laughs> you know, he also resisted Trump and didn't call the legislature back in in an effort to, you know, to undo the vote. So um, both of these guys, the stakes, it's not just a symbolic thing for Trump. The stakes are big for him if he runs again in 24. Also, there's this controversial new voting law in Georgia. This is, the, I think, the first election since this law has been in effect with concerns it could mean really long lines on Election Day, like we saw, you know, in, in some other elections previously. There's, there's concern that this is going to suppress voting, this new law. What are you hearing? Uh, there's absolutely concern about that. Um, there is concern that there will be efforts to suppress voting. Uh, there were allegations that when Kemp won the first time uh, that there was su suppression of the vote and that Kemp, uh, you know, Kemp had... Uh, you know, pulled some some magic out of his hat in order to win, and his allies in the Republican Party. Uh, you know, again, that's the same Governor Kemp who then uh, stonewalled Trump in his efforts to overturn Georgia's election results. So, one of the things that's interesting about primaries, of course, Ali, is that it's a test run, and we get to see all of these things before the general election battles, where we have that big Senate seat up, and uh, and of course the governor's race with. Uh, probably Kemp and certainly Stacey Abrams on the Democratic side. John Allen, thank you so much for that. A reminder, Georgia is a big deal. We will be there in person hitting the road. We're going to be down in Georgia for our road show Tuesday, talking all things primary day right here on NBC News Now. We'll see you there. Meantime, here on this show, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, Chicago police say a suspected shooter is in custody. After a shooting left at least two people dead, eight others hurt. It happened last night near McDonald's in the city's Gold Coast neighborhood. Officials say a fight started between two groups of people before somebody shot off a gun, but they're still looking into this whole thing. From our West Coast Bureau, the Archbishop of San Francisco says House Speaker Nancy Pelosi can no longer receive Holy Communion in the area because of her support for abortion rights. In a letter to the Speaker last month, the Archbishop had warned her to either deny her support for abortion rights or to not refer to her Catholic faith. Pelosi has not responded yet, but has defended her support for abortion access despite the church's stance against it. And from our Southeast Bureau, a Florida man has pleaded guilty to a $1.3 million romance scam. Brian Wedgworth pretended to be a doctor on dating apps. He convinced more than 30 women to send him money and jewelry and watches. Police say he even used 10 different fake names. He's facing up to a combined 30 years in prison. Now, to tonight's original, with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. Right now, we know that Russia really hasn't said much about the number of troops they've lost so far in their war in Ukraine. So now Ukrainian officials are using new technology, facial recognition software from a company based in the U.S. to try to help understand what's happening in their country and maybe identify some of those Russian soldiers who have invaded. The company Clearview AI has been able to pinpoint thousands of soldiers within seconds. So NBC News decided, hey, let's put that technology to the test. Josh Letterman, who you see there, has the story. 
In its David and Goliath fight against Russia, Ukraine is getting a high-tech boost from face recognition technology, artificial intelligence that can identify almost anyone just from a photo, the Ukrainians now using it to identify invading Russian soldiers and to seek justice. Each person which was uh, identified here is, uh, is a possibility for us to open criminal case against a specific person, against specific uh, criminal, war criminal. On the battlefield, Ukraine identifying dead Russian troops and sending photos of their bodies to their families back in Russia, a new digital form of psychological warfare. Take the battle for Kyiv. When Russian soldiers shot two civilians in the back, the killing caught on surveillance footage obtained by the BBC. And with the facial recognition uh, tool, we were able to identify uh, one of that soldiers, and uh, now we have criminal case. The software comes from Clearview AI, an American company that scraped 20 billion photos from the internet and social media sites, sparking controversy over privacy and bans in multiple countries. I saw all the images coming out of Ukraine, um, and some of them are very distressing, disturbing, uh, of women and children fleeing. And the other thing that really struck me was some of these uh, people who had been captured, captured Russian soldiers, uh, and I realized that perhaps facial recognition technology could help identify them. Clearview says it's giving Ukraine the technology for free, but does it really work? We want to test out whether this works on someone who doesn't post a billion photos of them online. So I'm going to call up my friend Kelly in West Virginia. She keeps a pretty low profile online. I spend time on social media, but I don't post often. <laughs> what about Instagram? The only pictures that have me in them on Instagram are all on a private account. She's not sure that the software is going to be able to figure out who she is. Should we try it? Absolutely. All right, let's do it. First step is basically you find a file and you upload. And so here is your friend. Never done this before. So we'll see if it works. Marshall. Marshall University, that's her. Yeah. Clearview says the software is so good, it works on faces with masks, even on bodies of soldiers whose faces have been disfigured by war. I want to test that too. So a special effects artist is distorting my face, nothing gruesome, to try to throw the computer off. So what we'll do is we'll do another search here. And this is the photo that they gave you with a different nose. And um, we'll see if it happens. Oh my God, so that's me. 93 photos here. It looks at all the things that stay the same uh, through, through age. So there's just only some variation in the nose area and the chin area. It's still picking up on these other features that stay the same. Clearview says nearly 500 Ukrainian officials have access, conducting more than 24,000 searches since the war started. Ukrainian officials tell NBC News they're also using it at checkpoints to root out potential Russian infiltrators. Some of your critics say that you're trying to promote this Ukraine work to sort of whitewash the very profound privacy concerns that people have about the software. A lot of people's minds on facial recognition were changed around Gen 6 when the insurrection happened. It was very instrumental in being able to make identifications quickly. So I think any new technology will have detractors and misunderstandings, especially on how it's really used in practice. We live in a digital world. And uh, this world will never be uh, the same. Josh Letterman, NBC News. Coming up here after the break, Preakness weekend is upon us, but the Kentucky Derby winner is not going to be racing. We'll tell you why when we come back. It is Preakness weekend in Baltimore. A lot of people are going to be there, but you know who's not going to be there? Rich Strike. The winner of the Kentucky Derby, sitting out the middle leg of this year's Triple Crown. You remember Rich Strike? You have to remember Rich Strike, the like 80 to 1 underdog. Remember this? The right side of your screen, jockeys in the red helmet. Incredibly improbable moment, captured the heart of the nation by pulling in the lead at Churchill Downs in the final second to win the Derby. It was a bananas moment. It's not going to be repeated at the, pe at the Preakness. And here's why. Rich Strike's owner, Rick Dawson, says it was never the plan to try and run all three races. They want to give Richie, as they call him, more time to rest ahead of the Belmont Stakes on June 11th. And that decision is raising a lot of questions about whether this schedule, whether the Triple Crown schedule is just too hard on the horses. Steve Kornacki is at the Pimlico Racecourse in Baltimore. 
Okay, so Steve, the Triple Crown is three races in a matter of five weeks for a three-year-old horse, which to some people is kind of a lot. And now there's this whole discussion about whether or not there should be a, a rethinking of the of the structure of the schedule. Tell you, you know, a huge overhaul in first in a century kind of thing. Tell me about it. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a lot of tradition here, but this decision by Rick Strike and his owners not to run in this race really has kicked up a debate here. And basically, it comes down to this modern horse trainers, modern horse racing. It's uncommon to see horses run a race and then turn around two weeks later and run another race. And that's what they're being asked to do here between the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. This is really one of the rare occasions in the year when that happens. And a lot of trainers just don't like to do that. They like more rest time. They like more spacing between the races. So the argument you're really starting to hear is, hey, maybe it's time to space these out. You have the Derby. Maybe you wait a month. Then you do the Preakness. Then you won't have this situation where a horse like Rich Strike backs out. Maybe you'll get some other high quality horses that come in the race too. Who maybe would sit it out now and then maybe you wait another month and you do the Belmont and you spread it out like that. And you're hearing some talk along those lines, hmm. but there's also a pretty big pushback here from the traditionalists who say, hey, look, it is possible for a horse to run and win on two weeks rest. And the triple crown is supposed to be something special and unique and rare. And yeah. the ability of a horse to win three races in five weeks is special, unique and rare. We've only had had to do it in the last 40 something years so the traditionalists say hey if you start messing with that mm. it's not going to be as special when it actually happens well tell us who we should be looking for because no no rich strike right but there is a compelling storyline in a horse named secret oath a female horse and her trainer it's always great when you have this storyline of a girl taking on the boys, a filly <laughs> running in the Preakness tomorrow. You, know, you go back about a half a century, and there's maybe two dozen fillies that have run in one of these triple crown races. So it's not unheard of, but it's extremely rare. But this horse has a real chance. You know, two weeks ago, this horse, Secret Oath, won the Kentucky Oaks. That's sort of like the Kentucky Derby for fillies. They hold it the night before the Kentucky Derby. Incredibly impressive performance there. Going to be one of the top choices on the uh, uh, on the betting board here. The horse is fun to watch because what she'll do is she'll sort of sit off the lead, and then the jockey will ask her to go. And when she does, when she goes, she has been blowing past horses and leaving them in the dust. That's what she did in the Kentucky Oaks. She's done that in some other races, and it's an even more compelling story because of her trainer. Her trainer is 86 years old, D. Wayne Lucas. He has been at this game forever. He still gets up and goes to work at 3.30 in the morning. It's been a long time since D. Wayne Lucas had a horse this good in a race this big. So great to, a great angle there with Secret Oath tomorrow. Totally, uh, Steve. And listen, always bet on the woman, right? Always bet on the female. That's what I'm going to be doing. I think it's a good life lesson. So listen, I went to college in Baltimore. I've been to the Preakness once in the infield. That's all I could handle. It is a scene. It is a vibe. Tell me a little bit about what it's like now, because again, we're seeing again, this is really the first time since the pandemic that it's going to be a packed crowd there. Yeah, and your so today is you know Black Eyed Susan Day. That's the big race today, the Black Eyed Susan Stakes. So it's a bit of a warm up act for tomorrow. So we got a pretty big crowd here, but it's it's nothing compared to what folks are expecting tomorrow. And the weather looks it's not going to rain. It looks like it looks like it's going to be very hot. And yeah, you know I think I'm going to be a little too old to be in that infield <laughs> tomorrow. I'll leave that to the college kids tomorrow. Mm -mm. It's, it's been almost 20 years, Stephen. I'm good. Like I'm good at this point. Steve Kornacki, thank you so <laughs> yeah. much. Um, I appreciate. Appreciate you. Can't wait to watch it tomorrow uh, on the big stage on NBC. Talk to you, Frau. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Hack. In London right now, officials are working on some big preparations to celebrate Queen Elizabeth's 70 years on the throne, with Buckingham Palace revealing a really celeb, starry, famous people lineup for a public concert. Diana Ross, Elton John, Queen, you know, the band, not the person. We still aren't 100% clear on whether the person, the queen herself, will be attending all this stuff. Molly Hunter reports on what we know.
Hey, Holly, that's right. This country is in party planning mode and the festivities are already off to the races. So this is the Platinum Jubilee. This marks the Queen's 70 years on the throne. She is the first British monarch to hit this uh, unbelievably impressive milestone. And the celebrations will match the event. So one of the reasons we're not at Buckingham Palace right now is because one of the main events, Holly, is they're setting up this huge public concert. They are building a giant stage outside the palace. The A-listers who will be playing, the band Queen, appropriately named, of course, Sir Elton John, Duran Duran, Alicia Keys, and Diana Ross. Diana Ross is no stranger to royal performances. This is not Ross's first time performing for the Queen. She expressed her excitement, Hallie, uh, on social media for performing for the Queen uh, again. Now, a couple big questions, though, as we enter this momentous week. So it's still unclear if the 96-year-old monarch will actually be in attendance. She's been battling mobility issues. Uh, she used a cane the other day to actually get to the royal box at the Royal Horse Show at Windsor, one of her favorite uh, events. And they're basically making the call day by day what events she's actually gonna show up at. The other big question, of course, Harry and Meghan are coming back. We know that. We know they will not be on the balcony for that big, famous uh, family photo op. But what will the other photo ops be? When will they interact with the Queen? What will that reunion be like? And of course, will Archie and Lilibet get to spend some quality time with their great-grandmother? And we just want to see pictures of all of it, Hallie. It is the talk of the town. I'll send it back to you. Molly Hunter, appreciate that. Appreciate all you watching all week long. That does it for this hour. We're going to have more for you here Monday, of course, same time, same place. Hope you have a great weekend. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.